Uh, let me start off with a post-war Sri Lanka. It's been over a year now the war in Sri Lanka has come to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, are you satisfied with the post-war events in the country and the resettlement process which the government says is almost coming to an end? Well, I think it's clear that there's been a tremendous amount of progress. Uh, and I think uh, we frankly don't give the government of Sri Lanka enough credit for the way it's managed the huge logistical and humanitarian uh, project, if you want to call it that. Um, I also think that the international community led by the United Nations has uh, risen to the challenge. And we, the U.S., are proud to have been part of that with our contributions in areas like the mining and health and and food and shelter. Um, having said that, I think that, I don't know that I would say the resettlement process is over. I think that um, until all the displaced have been returned to, if not their actual home, of course, but the village, and in some sort of shelter, um, I can't say that resettlement is complete. And I, I don't want people to forget the, what we call the old IDPs, including the, the Muslim community. Uh, forced out by the LTT 20 years ago. Uh, until they've actually been accommodated, I think the process is still kind of open. Um, I would also say somewhat unfairly, as soon as the government resolves one set of issues, others come up. That's just the way it is. And I would point to things like the tremendous number of disabled people now uh, as a result of the, the, the war. They have to be accommodated. Uh, the number of households headed by single women who have small children, how are they going to live? Um, people who have land disputes and, uh, and uh, need, need help with that. And I also think that people are still looking for lost loved ones. So until those issues are addressed, I, I would say that account of record of resettlement is still an issue. But I think the important thing is that the government uh, focuses, maintains its focus on the IDPs as a population that will be continued. Um, it's been, as I said before, it's been almost over a year, 11, 12, 13 months since the war has come to an end. Uh, we are, Sri Lanka is a developing country. So as a developing country, are you satisfied at the pace what we have achieved so far, where IDPs are concerned? I think, I would say yes, in most areas. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, there's still a lot of people that live in, in you know, the last year or so of the large population of the Syrian life. I think you want to uh, welcome the existence of the international community. Uh, we've been a partner with that. And so I think up to now, uh, the, the progress has been pretty good. That's not to say that there aren't areas where folks still need to be done. I think there are still we have less than 30,000 RDPs who you know, have freedom of movement, but we're still not able to look at it. And I think uh, the mining still has to be uh, completed. That's a huge task that we are helping. And, and I, I do think there are issues, as I mentioned earlier, that are linked to the settlement. Uh, people need to know where the loved ones are, are they in the Catholic camps, are they there, are they missing? Uh, how are uh, people in the community are lying with it? So it's a continuum. So I, I think I would say yes, yeah, that the Toronto government has done a tremendous job in really educating uh, as, as time goes on, but what it means for me. And they need to keep, and I think we are keeping their focus on uh, the situation as we go. I think it's a little early for me personally to, uh, to prejudge or judge the commission. They're still doing their work. Uh, uh, I think the mandate expires in December. I'm hearing uh, the possibility that they would need to extend it. Uh, we've been very encouraged uh, by the fact that they have uh, traveled around the country uh, to take testimony, which means that people are, uh, can have access to them, uh, people in Toronto and, and Jaffa and other places in the East. And people have come forward to them and uh, uh, to tell their stories, to, com to say what their daily needs are, as well as, you know, in some cases quite bravely, to talk about the, the last awful weeks of the fighting and what they may or may not have seen in terms of civilian deaths. 
or, or war crimes. So um, I think that the commission, we look to the commission, we look to the government to investigate credibly and as thoroughly as possible any allegations of violations of human rights and, and possible war crimes. That is something that uh, the U.S. certainly remains very, very focused on. Okay. Um, the Sri Lankan government has been quite worried about the LTT's international network mm -hmm. and the impact it's going to have on peace in Sri Lanka. Um, recently, we heard reports that uh, we, Rudra Kumar, who's operating on U.S. Mm -hmm. soil, has been appointed as the so-called Prime Minister of the Tamil Elam Transnational Government. Um, so I just need to know, um, are these people free uh, and are they allowed uh, to conduct their anti-Sri Lankan uh, uh, events on U.S. soil? Well, I can understand how the Sri Lankan government views them as, as anti-Sri Lankan events, but um, I think our record as a, as a government, as a country, is quite clear. We banned the LTT in 1997 as a foreign terrorist organization, and it's still on that list. Now, that list is reviewed periodically, but still remains a terrorist organization. That means that it's, it's against U.S. law to provide any material support to the LTTV or its remnants now, such as it may exist. Um, we, we have prosecuted and I believe convicted, on possibly, I think up to 20 people already under these laws, under U.S. laws, uh, for providing that material support. Uh, most recently, a jury in Baltimore, Maryland, convicted a, a, a national citizen of Singapore for providing support. So I think our record is pretty good. Now, at the same time, uh, in the United States, we have constitutional guarantees for freedom of expression and freedom of assembly, which means that people in the U.S. can protest, can demonstrate, can write opinions, uh, can disagree with not only foreign governments, but with, with the U.S., with our own government. So I think that the U.S., just like Sri Lanka, has to constantly balance national security concerns with constitutional liberties. Okay. Um, let's shift more towards the Sri Lankan political parties here where the opposition is concerned. Um, is the U.S. happy with what the opposition parties in the country uh, is, are, are doing for the country right now? And do you think that they can play a much more important role? Well, I'm not going to comment on the, um, the, the state of the opposition here or individual parties. I, I will say, though, that in general, um, a vibrant effective opposition is one of the foundations of any democracy, whether it's in the U.S. or Sri Lanka or anywhere else. So we, we, um, we, we believe very firmly that the opposition has a very important role to play. Uh, you know, no one party or person has all the answers. And it, uh, an, op an effective opposition keeps whatever government's in power, it keeps them honest. It promotes debate, it brings issues into the open, it forces the government to explain why it's taking the position it's taking. And therefore, citizens have a chance, have a choice. They can say, well, okay, here are the issues and this is the way I want to go. I think a, a healthy opposition also points, uh, forces the government uh, to compromise. It, it forces any government uh, to come to the table to discuss an issue compromise. That's the essence of democracy. And the result generally is better for the people and the country. So I, I would say that that's the role of any opposition, whether it's in Sri Lanka or elsewhere. Oh, what about the 17th Amendment? I mean, the U.S. has always been uh, calling on the Sri Lankan government to yeah. implement the 17th Amendment. But the Sri Lankan government went one step higher and implemented the 18th Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, does the 18th Amendment fall in line with the U.S. expectations? Well, you're right. We were uh, very focused on the 17th Amendment and uh, the independent commissions that we have been uh, uh, appointed under it. Uh, but uh, and we we were not um, we were concerned with the passage of the 18th Amendment because, in our view, it it weakens the checks and balances on what is now a very powerful executive presidency um, and. Um, uh, it it uh, also uh, eliminated term limits for, for the president. So, in our view, uh, we have a much stronger presidency now, regardless of who okay. occupies it. Yeah. This is not an issue of personalities, this is institutions. A very strong executive presidency uh, and uh, very 
limited uh, controls on its power and authority. You're really counting on the goodwill of the occupant of the office. So right now, we look to this, this very powerful government now to um, guarantee to Sri Lankans that they will be able to enjoy the benefits of good governance, I would say, of rule of law, promotion of rule of law, of uh, reconciliation, uh, and also with the political power sharing in the provinces. So there's an even greater responsibility on this government. Um, can you just explain to us a little bit the U.S. GSP's concern? Uh, mm -hmm. There were certain stories very recently that uh, the U.S. was reviewing its entire GSP uh, for Sri Lanka. Can you just give us an update as to what exactly is happening where that is concerned? Sure. It's actually uh, a very positive uh, news story at this point. Um, we had a, a group of U.S. experts come in and they visited uh, Sri Lanka about a month or six weeks ago uh, to look at the labor situation, to look at the complaints that had been made. And they had complete access to talk to you. However, they wanted to do government, labor, business. Uh, it, was, it was quite a decision. So they left here with a pretty good understanding of the situation. That was followed by public hearings in Washington, chaired by our U.S. trade representatives. Uh, and of course, the Sri Lankan government uh, was invited to participate. They sent a very competent, very informed team. So they made their case. Uh, our AFL-CIO Labor Federation made their case and the Sri Lankan Labor Union made their case. So again, more information. And now our USQR trade rep is going to be reviewing all the information and we will continue, they will continue the discussion, the negotiation with the Sri Lankan government quietly. We're not going to do this in the press, it's not going to be a public thing. Um, I will say that the um, assistant, uh, our acting U.S. trade representative for South Asia, Mike Zeleny, um, who chaired, I think, the hearing in Washington, was here this last week to lead the, uh, our delegation to the Tisa talks, as we call them. And I think he said publicly that he was very optimistic about our being able to work with the government here and resolve these issues. So I can't say what the final result will be, but all indications are that it's been a cooperative uh, effort and I, th I think we'll come out ahead with it. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for your time. Thank you.